This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. My name is Josh Rapoon, and this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. This series is committed to giving full voice to innovative, creative, and imaginative educators and education leaders across the Hawaiian Islands. Our goal is a thousand points of light, and the wind is fully in our sails. As we close out 2021, we are still firmly fixed on the North Star that is student-driven, real-world learning. Speaking of a thousand points of light, my guest today is Dr. Julie Maurer, the acting director of the Center for Community Engagement at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Dr. Maurer is also the director of the English Language Institute, also at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Dr. Maurer gained her EDD in professional educational practice in 2020 from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She has a master's in teaching English to speakers of other languages from San Francisco State University and a BA in English, emphasis in literature from Lewis and Clark College in Oregon, among other certifications. Dr. Maurer is also active with Vibrant Hawaii as co-chair of the Education Committee, and she is co-convening Vibrant's workforce and professional development team. Vibrant is a community-building movement on the island of Hawaii. Sometimes one can draw conclusions about a person from the campus, community, and professional development listings on his or her resume. Such is the case with Dr. Maurer, whose resume is a mile deep and rich with interesting experiences. In her dissertation, Dr. Maurer wrote, quote, As a young adult, I traveled to Ecuador on a study abroad program while finishing my bachelor's degree in English. Like reading in action form, traveling enabled me to see these different ways of living and seeing the world that previously I had only read about. I fell in love with learning about different cultures and returned to the United States wanting to somehow combine my passions for language and culture." End quote. And now, here's my conversation with Dr. Julie Maurer. Julie, welcome to the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. Hi, Josh. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. So, Julie, during a recent Hawaii Business Magazine panel on education, you, one of the panelists, talked about two seminal events that happened in your first year teaching. And I was really moved by your story and wondered if you could share it here at the beginning of this conversation. Of course. My first year of teaching really shaped, I think, a lot of my career and how I think about education and how I think about my relationships with my students and and what that looks like. So I started teaching in 2001 and I was at um, San Francisco State University teaching in the English department. And that was the year that 9-11 happened. And So September is fairly close to the beginning of the year, and it's one of those moments in teaching when you really have to throw out the lesson plan, right? Like there's no talking about anything except for what is happening in the world and being there, just kind of being present for what students need. And so that aspect of my first year really got me thinking about the context of the world that's going on around us, right? That we always have this kind of old saying about there's, you know, college and then there's the real world kind of in quotes. Right. And, you know, the two are not two separate things. They're very much connected. And, and what do we do with that? So I taught that year, I was teaching freshman English, and after the semester ended in that summer, I learned that one of my students from the previous semester had committed suicide. Mm. And 
it really was devastating. It was devastating for multiple reasons, but um, this was a student who was trying to work his way out of a gang that he had joined at a young age and, you know, eventually found that he wasn't able to make that break. And it was clearly more than he he didn't quite know where to turn. Mm -hmm. And so that also was a really powerful point in recognizing in some ways our students are really fragile and they're really um, searching and trying to figure things out in a complex world. And so the role that we play in that search can be um, really significant in their lives. And, you know, as I look back, I don't think as a first year teacher, I had enough grasp on that. Mm. And so really understanding kind of that relationship and how we connect with students in ways, especially as a writing teacher, that, you know, help you understand who they are. So these two bookends, you know, I really look back and kind of reflect on how I started by being reminded that this context of the world that our students come to us is not separate right. and who they are and the struggles that they're going through, how we interact with those and impact and connect with those is a part of what we do mm-hmm. and and should be. It, it does it's not a separate thing from from teaching. It's part of the deal. Yeah. Wow. You know, I recall uh I was hired to teach US history at La Pietra Hawaii School for Girls two weeks mm-hmm. before 9-11. And oh my gosh. Uh, we had just gotten started, so very similar experience. And I remember, you know, that as we moved through the moment, and it was very much as you described, it was sort of like the whole world was fragile. I remember that there was yeah. a, a concert uh, in New York to honor the victims, and Sting sang his song Fragile, which was just an extremely emotional oh. moment. But I, I recall that what I started doing very instinctually as a teacher, I wasn't new, I had I'd taught before, um, was to take the front page of the Honolulu um, paper, the Star Advertiser, and um, each day, the day after 9-11 and going forward for the rest of the year, I slowly but surely taped them to the wall of the classroom, mm. one after the other each day. And it started you know, with that shocking kind of moment, and then slowly but surely as we moved towards all the events that were subsequent to that. Um, and so, you know, when I when I learned that that in that panel that you had experienced that moment and also, you know, the suicide of a student, which is, you know, which is really heavy. These are the things that define us as people, but very much as educators as well. So I appreciate yeah. you sharing that story. Um, so, Julie, by your own reckoning, you spend the greater percent of your time as the director of UH Hilo's English Language Institute, and your resume, going back a few years, is heavy in its emphasis on building English proficiency skills in college-level students. So I know this is a huge question, and this is a relatively short podcast, but what is the North Star or the true north of English language acquisition? I imagine all college campuses in Hawaii, and probably elsewhere, but in Hawaii, invest heavily in English language learners. Why? Language is such a powerful thing, right? It can close doors and it can open doors for people. And I first started my career actually volunteering in a classroom at um, Santa Rosa Junior College. And so my experience volunteering there, because I wanted to better understand what that looked like before I actually applied to go back and get my master's, was a group of students who worked full-time all day, mostly from Mexico, who were coming to school at night in order to build their skills to get better jobs here. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the foundation of my learning. It was 
you know, how can people reach their goals? What are the, what are the skills and abilities that they need in order to do that? And how can we help them get there? Mm-hmm. But here in Hawaii, it's a little bit of a different story, right? So I love the language acquisition of second language because I am such a firm believer in the value of being multilingual. And in the past, there was this emphasis on kind of assimilation, right? When people acquired a second language, they really left their their mother tongue mm-hmm. and moved into this new space. And you would hear parents tell their children, you know, don't worry about that one. That's just going to hold you back. Only focus on English because that's going to make you successful. And now, you know, I was really fortunate to go to school at a time when that was not, that was no longer the message. That was not the thinking. It was maintain your mother tongue because it holds so much wisdom and knowledge in there that you want to pass down to your children and raise your children bilingual, Mm. which is not going to hold them back in any way, shape, or form. It's going to help them cognitively. It's going to help them culturally. It's going to help them socially so that they can work to build that sense of belonging in multiple places. Mm. So they can go into one space and feel that sense of belonging They can go into a very different space of their heritage Mm -hmm. and not be disconnected, which is what happens, right? When people lose their mother tongue, you have a generation that can't talk to their grandparents anymore. Right. So that's the, you know, that's really the current thinking within the field. And in a space like Hawaii, that mentality and that thinking, I think, is really important. Mm of really honoring, you know, the value and the wisdom and the knowledge that that languages hold of a culture. So that's awesome and that's that's the why which is you you express that beautifully. I want to shift to the how for a second here. Um back in 2010 you and your language lab program at UH Hilo were nominated for what's called the Taniguchi Award for Excellence in Innovation. So now Julie, here we are 11 years later, everywhere you go in Hawaii and elsewhere, we find (laughs) conversations around innovation and education. And so my question is, in in what ways have those conversations impacted pedagogy associated with English language learning? For example, like how has project-based learning or problem-based or place-based or culture-based learning impacted English language proficiency teaching, if at all? Oh, it has tremendously, actually. Mm. So this is another shift that we've seen within the field that influenced me a great deal. There was in the past kind of this focus on language as a grammatical structure, right? Which is why most second language learning programs are really grounded in linguistics. So it's the structure of language. Mm. But in, in the pedagogy, it's the use of language. It's all about application, right? Mm. And if you go into an ESL classroom, if you see a teacher doing all of the talking, you're witnessing somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. Mm. Because when you're learning language, you have to use the language. And it's a very risky endeavor. Mm. And when I, you know, I did a a study abroad program when I was in college, and this is where I really realized how scary it is. Mm. It is incredibly, it really makes you question your identity and kind of how you see yourself when you're trying to express yourself authentically in a second language. This was in Ecuador, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was in South America. And so that really, uh, you know, kind of shaped how I taught in the classroom, which was all about 
I'm creating first and foremost an environment in which students know each other, mm-hmm. they've built relationships with each other, they trust each other so that they can try out the language, make mistakes, sound like they're, you know, in second grade instead of age 20. And it's okay. It's that environment is there for them. And we're all, you know, supporting that. And there's no shame involved in that endeavor. Mm. The second part of that is that it's all interacting. And it's, you know, the more I talk, the less that they're using the language and the less that they're learning. So it has to be me providing opportunities and meaningful ways for them to listen to things, to read things, to engage with things at a level that is meaningful and relevant to them, but not, you know, burdened with Mm. complicated language and things like that, right? right? So it's accessible but not in a childish way. It's accessible in a sophisticated and meaningful way. Mm. And then they can take that and they will talk and write and, you know, have discussions and go from there. So those are really the two Mm. key elements. And that has then followed me as I, you Mm. know, change directions in how I kind of approach things. You know, that's just, it's so interesting, Julie, because I did an episode with a a charter school uh, math teacher, sixth grade, and Mm. she said essentially the same thing that you did, which is first and (laughs) foremost, she wanted to have a classroom where the kids felt trusted and where there was, they were trusting relationships, they felt safe, they felt included. Um, And that that risk was honored. And so whether it's math or chemistry or whatever subject or or English language, when you start from that place, then you can do all sorts of things with them. And it's in the application um, where the risk happens, right? So for her, it was was like the kids felt scared about what they knew about math, but she created an environment first that made them feel safe and then moved into it. So... Right? That, that's just yeah. awesome. And that that is the definition of innovation. It's not, you know, I have an iPad and therefore I'm being innovative, <laughs> right? That's that's so cool. Um, so perfect. So, so Julie, I want to shift our conversation towards an element of your life that you wish, I suspect, you could spend more time on, which is community building and community engaged learning. So I want to mm-hmm. I want to start this line of questions by asking about the focus of your dissertation, uh, which you finished during the pandemic. Um, But before we get into that, I wanna ask about your son, Josh. Um, In the acknowledgements which start your dissertation, you talk about Josh and how you two shaped your lives to meet your mutual needs as learners and also as a mom and a son. So I've never read anything quite like this in a dissertation acknowledgement. And I think our (laughs) listeners would love to know how you and Josh navigated your doctoral work, which happened to include a global pandemic. Yeah, those were some, (laughs) those were some tough years. Yeah. And nothing will make you question whether you've made the right choice than, you know, being a mom to, you know, he was, he's 11 now. And so he was eight, nine, 10 during this period Mm -hmm. and trying to go to class, work full time, write a dissertation and be a mom. And I'm not sure if anybody, you know, is looking for an answer on how to do this fabulously. I, (laughs) I do not I do not have that answer. Um, But what I have tried to do is is to demonstrate that, you know, I was 45 years old when I went back um, to school and it had been, you know, 15 years since I finished my master's. And so I wanted to, to demonstrate to him that learning doesn't have to stop, that you can... Um, make these choices at any point in time if you want to, that we could um, 
that our time that we spent together, um, I made sure that I wasn't distracted during those periods of time. Mm, So it was, it was a lot of, if I'm writing, I'm writing. If I'm with my son, I'm with my son Mm. and trying to kind of keep those. But yeah, that final year during the pandemic, that was rough. Yeah. And it sounds like the two of you sort of navigated it with grace. I, that word has come into my head, um, that you were, you were figuring <laughs> more or less, you know, figuring it out as, as you went. And also in your acknowledgements, you acknowledge all of the other folks who helped along the way, um, for the two of you to be able to move through it together. And I just, I just wanted our listeners to hear that because, I think it's important, you know, people do dissertations, but we rarely think about what the circumstances were when work like that is produced. I think the one thing I would add to that is that I chose my program very carefully. And I chose a program that focused on what I believe to be important. Um, It was a program in education for practitioners it was an EDD instead of a PhD, and mm. it was cohort based as well. So, you yeah. know, we were, it was a group who could support each other. And yeah. that became really important, especially there at the end where I had a writing partner who, and we kept each other going, you yep. know, through that, that period. So it, it isn't, I think the PhD and and some people's experiences are very solitary. Yes. And I feel like I was extremely fortunate that mine really wasn't that experience. Yeah, same for me. I I went through a very solitary experience when I wrote or when I did my master's program and and writing my thesis and I look back at with some regret that I wasn't in a cohort. I wish I had. Mm-hmm. I think I would have really thrived. Had I been in yeah. something like that, so yeah. So Julie, yeah. your your dissertation title is as follows: Student Voices at UH Hilo. Do I belong here? A case study on student perception of community engaged teaching and how it impacts their sense of belonging at UH Hilo. So your doctoral thesis was, if I have it right, that community engaged teaching would impact and benefit students in a variety of ways, not the least of which was their sense of belonging. So could you take us through the concise version of how you came to your (laughs) thesis and what you found in your study? Well, I was really just curious. I had been doing a lot of research on community-engaged teaching and You know, we kind of make these assumptions sometimes when we read about something like, this is it. This is, you know, that this is going to be something that our students would really, really dig into. Mm -hmm. It had all of the things that I, I thought our students would really like. And so, but it started with the question of, am I making an assumption that is correct or not? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to find out. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I did this study on Dr. Misty Pacheco's kinesiology class. And it was a large class, 75 students. Wow. And it was Mm project-based. They worked with a community partner here on the island. And they were looking at creating something and they were doing basically an awareness campaign about vaping and Mm. there were a lot of different elements to that um, depending on who their audience was what type of campaign they were doing video you know um, paper interviews and so the class was broken up into teams based on their interest and the you know, what I think of as the client, but the community partner was involved throughout the semester. And Dr. Pacheco, they co-created this project and Mm -hmm. implemented it. They used a flipped classroom, which Mm -hmm. is really, you know, from the student's response, worked extremely well for this type of work. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to learn kind of the elements of public health 
by working on this campaign all the way through the semester. Mm, wow. So they were applying you know, the theory, a real world experience. They were getting feedback from the, the community partner throughout of like, well, that's not really going to work or, you know, and then they did their final presentations um, to the community partner as well as the professor. And those creations, what they developed went to the community partner for their use. Mm -hmm. And so you have these very real deliverables. And what I was curious about is whether this type of work impacted this, these kind of what I think of as two areas in the sense of belonging, their sense of belonging in terms of academia itself, right? Like we have at UH Hilo a lot of students who are really unsure if this is the right path for them, right. who may not have been planning to go to college all of their lives type of thing. So they're questioning, do I belong at the university? Is this the right place for me? And then the second part is, do I belong at this actual place in Hawaii yeah. at UH Hilo itself? So those two aspects. And so I was in the classroom a lot. I worked with the students throughout and surveyed them at the beginning, middle and end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And that information is, is what I used as the data which was qualitative. It was a lot of, there, there are some quantitative elements, but it was a lot of the students writing reflections mm. Um, mm -hmm. on their experience. And it became so clear as I went through the process and, and really took in what they were talking about that for them, the emotional engagement and the social engagement, the fact that they, social engagement meaning they knew other students in the classroom. Every time they would come in, they're like, hey, how's it going? You know, there's this mm -hmm. very familiar connection between the students because they'd work together. And then the emotional of, you know, is their learning meaningful to them and their lives? And do they see it as being relevant to their future? Mm -hmm. And those two things drove their behavioral engagement of how much they were willing to invest into this project and their cognitive in how much they felt comfortable participating in kind of the academic discourse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so for me... That was a huge, I, I mean, I, I probably could have, I, I would have suspected that. But the way that the students talked about it just made it so crystal clear mm -hmm. of how important those elements were, that they were in a place where they felt seen, they felt like what they were doing was meaningful to their actual lives and what they knew as the, you know, quote unquote, real world. And that it was relevant. And because it was a, a real world problem, a real world, you know, project, that came really naturally to them. Mm. And so how much they were willing to invest went way up because, you know, it's not just for a grade, right? It's not like a paper that only your teacher is going to see. This is actually going to be on somebody's website. Yep. There mm. were things that went to legislators, you know. And so the students were like, oh, yeah, we got to kick it in gear here. <laughs> right, right, right. Wow. that's And it's just, it's so remarkable to me that, that Dr. Pacheco was able to achieve this with 70 students in her class. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's um, you know, that's, it's a testament to what you, to what you can do. And if you think that having a large number of students is, you know, the end of any sort of creativity and, and in the classroom, then, you know, I, I hope that you would listen to that story that you just told and believe that it could be otherwise. Um, so I, yeah. that's, that's great. That's awesome. So, hey, everyone, stay with us. After this short break, we will continue our conversation with Julie Maurer. Hi, friends. Toy Hirschman here from the Entre Ed Talk podcast. I am super excited to support the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast hosted by none other than the amazing Josh Rapoon. And 
I also want to give a big shout out to all of the incredible educators in Hawaii who are doing unreal things in the entrepreneurship and design-based thinking spaces. I hope you all subscribe and listen to What School Could Be in Hawaii. And also, hey, why not check out the EntreEd Talk podcast where we interview stellar entrepreneurial educators and entrepreneurs from across the country and globe. I cannot wait to connect with you. Aloha, my name is Aaron Shorn, a previous guest on this very podcast. I am also now head of growth and community at Hawaii's own Unruler. Unruler is a collaborative mobile and web platform that accelerates innovation, grows culture and community, and celebrates learning. Learners post multimedia, tag their learning, and through comments are able to work together asynchronously. Each post is a moment of learning that forms the foundation of a joyous learning journey. We can be found at UNR. ULR.com. Mahalo. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast, and we're back with Julie Maurer, the acting director of the Center for Community Engagement at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. So Julie, you wrote a paper, which I found fascinating for a leadership course you were taking while you were working as an administrator at the UH Hilo (laughs) Center for Community Engagement. And you wrote about working through some fears, I suppose, about speaking for the center. And I'm gonna quote Mm. a line from your 2019 paper, quote, I haven't fully accepted yet my ability to impact faculty and administrators at the university, end quote. So clearly you are committed to the idea of, quote, student voice, but it seems like you had to work on finding your voice first or along the way. So can you describe that process and the vulnerabilities you had to work through as you worked to develop your voice and the ways that you could speak for the center? Mm, That's a great question. And to be honest, I think this is a journey that I'm still on. You know, I went into education. I think I've always been a little bit of the black sheep. Mm. When you're in higher ed, Teaching ESL is really kind of this, it's not fully accepted into the academy as a real discipline. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then I really valued helping students. I just always felt like my role was in helping students to find their passions and find where they could really shine. And helping them to get there. So I didn't see myself as somebody who was going to be on the forefront of being visible, I think. I'm much more comfortable in the role of listening and learning and writing. Mm. And so finding myself in the position I'm in now, in working with community, In some ways, I'm comfortable because it's still a role of learning and listening um, from our community. That's really what my priority is in order to understand how the university can best serve. But there's a much more visible and uh, leadership type of role at this point as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where... You know, when you step forward and when you step back becomes a really important. And when you're, you know, maybe putting somebody else forward to lift up their work, I, I still would much prefer to to do that than. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, and I and I definitely I suspect. Yeah, you can ahead. relate, right? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I was going to say that, um, you know, I feel exactly the same way. And and while I was reading yeah. your blogs, I was thinking, you know, about the extent to which as a writer, you're capable, very capable of speaking for other people, but also speaking for yourself and what you believe. But doing that, yeah. you know, verbally with people is a completely different thing. So yeah, I, I I definitely hear what you were saying there about that. Yeah, and I think it's it's a lot of those of us who grew up reading, right? That's kind of our comfort zone is right. in that 
place of reading and processing. I found that I really process what I think through writing. I, you know, can honestly say I usually don't know what I think until I really write about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then things start to really become clear and connections start to appear that in my head it doesn't always happen that way. And as I'm speaking, it doesn't always happen that way. Yeah, yeah. So it's still a learning, you know, process. But the more that I do it, the more that I do kind of step forward and speak, you know, what I am learning and growing into, I think. You know, mm-hmm. when I went from a field that I felt very comfortable in. I felt like I had worked in it a long time. I had a lot of experience. So I, you know, was much more comfortable. And then I moved into a different role and a different field. And so there's that process of still growing, learning, um, mm-hmm. and, and sharing that out and stepping forward. Yeah, that's awesome. So also speaking of place, you wrote in that paper about some realizations related to the importance of place in teaching and learning and how you came to understand Mm. that you were pretty good at telling other stories, but not your own, as we were just talking about. So let's pry (laughs) these two things apart and let's approach them separately. So here in 2021, some years into your life as an educator and education leader, what is your sense now of the importance of place in learning? I think it's always incredibly important because place plays such a strong role in identity and who, you know, within education, it's who are you teaching? What is the context that they're coming from? And place is something that informs that tremendously. So if you're going from place to place, whether it's within the country or internationally, Mm -hmm what is going to be relevant and meaningful for students is going to change. So there may be certain things that are true across the board. I think you can go anywhere and have students talk about, you know, family. That is -hmm. is something that all kind of communities and cultures have something to say about. But more specifically... If I'm teaching in Hawaii, that's very different. The Mm -hmm. cultures that I'm teaching are different. What they are bringing to the table is very different. And so your teaching should be different. Here I find we have a really unfortunate kind of deficit thinking that I see in a lot of our students. And so for me, one of the things here... And this, you know, stems generationally from colonization, I would argue. Mm. And so what is important for students is to feel that they can do things, that they are capable, that they are intelligent, that they are creative, Mm. and demonstrating that back to them, kind of acting in some ways as a mirror to reflect their amazingness, you know, their what they're doing back to them. So they build mm. that that quality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a previous guest that I had on this podcast, um, Tammy Jones, we talked about teacher efficacy and even student efficacy. And I think that's what you're talking about there is that over the yeah. course of your life and most especially when you're given the opportunity as a learner to be connected to place and to have place honored in the teaching and learning that you begin to amass evidence of your ability to make this, that, or the other actually happen, that you can make things change in your life, that you can improve, you can grow, you can develop, because you don't have to believe that there's evidence in front of you. Um, but that doesn't happen, right, unless you unless you actually engage with place as part of the learning process. Is that a fair statement? I think that is a fair statement. Um, And so I think a lot of what I do is making that 
connection. Mm -hmm. Because I, I wouldn't necessarily say that you have to have students go out. Yeah. But they have to be connected somehow. Mm, there you go. And those connections so that they are talking to people and understanding those perspectives and listening to those stories is so important. I've never really understood how a student could possibly come to this amazing place with the culture and history and community that we have here mm -hmm. and not, and, you know, kind of go through four years of education and not actually learn that much about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that to me is kind of a travesty um, mm -hmm. because the richness that exists is really unique and it's a gift that we should be giving every student who comes here. Mm. And so how we do that, how we, you know, build in these opportunities for students to really become connected and have the both opportunities, but also skills and kind of knowledge in order to engage in positive ways mm -hmm. is incredibly important to me. Yeah. So I, I think that's a great segue to this last question before we go to our second break. And it, you might have answered it already, but but let's go for it anyway. You, This <laughs> seems like a good place along your timeline to talk about Mrs. Helen Sloat and her mantra, mm -hmm. if you're going to make a mistake, make a big one. Um, so Mrs. Yeah. Sloat was your violin teacher when you were very young, uh, but yeah. her, her mantra has informed your life ever since. And I frankly think that it is lame when interviewers ask their guests to talk about mistakes made. They never answer the question <laughs> anyway. So let me ask you a pedagogical question. So how do we help young people move beyond playing like a mouse, hiding mistakes, to fully embracing Mrs. Sloat's mantra? Oh, she was such an incredible woman. I feel really fortunate to have met her, even though I'm not sure I understood the wisdom of what she was trying to communicate at the time. Mm. You know, and when you're young, you yeah. you just think like, no. <laughs> yeah. But all learning, you know, kind of as, as we were talking earlier, all learning is risk taking. If, if you're not taking a risk, that means you're still doing something that you feel comfortable doing. And that is not where the real growth and, you know, stretching of ourselves comes from. Mm -hmm. And so I have over time, as much as I resist it, I have over time really come to embrace that idea of taking risks and of going for things, even when you're not 100% sure if it's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. There are no guarantees. And so better to, you know, put something out there, try it, and then kind of assess and see and, you know, fall and get back up and keep going. It has really served me well, actually. I think it's one of the things I probably believe in the most, but it does have a few requirements and that is somebody out there who's going to be okay with that, whether that is your, you know, boss, your colleagues, whoever you're working with as a team, you kind of have to all be in it together. Mm -hmm. If there's, you know, one person taking risks and falling and everybody else is kind of standing back and letting that person. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work, right? And so there needs to be that environment and that mindset that this is how we do things. Like we go for it and mm -hmm. we're, it's not going to work 100% of the time, but we're going to go for it. Mm -hmm. And this would be a great moment before we go to break to give a huge shout out to 
Misty Pacheco for going for it. Instead of just standing mm -hmm. at the front of the class and talking about kinesiology, she involved her Absolutely. kids in something that was incredibly relevant and real world and help build a classroom culture, according to your dissertation, that was quite remarkable. And uh, and so I just wanted to say that before we go <laughs> to break. So thank you for giving me that opportunity, Julie. So. <laughs> so hey, everyone, stay with us. We'll be back in a moment with more from Julie Maurer. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. As a What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast listener, I know you're curious about what's happening in Hawaii schools. This is Christy Oda, and together with National Board Certified Teachers, we launched Educators Edge, a new podcast that gathers innovative educators with diverse perspectives to collaborate around a topic of their choice. There's something so special about hearing teachers talk story about the work they do to transform education for Hawaii's young learners. I invite you to listen on Apple, Spotify, Google, or Anchor, or go to bit.ly slash educators edge to subscribe. Aloha and mahalo. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast, and we are back with Julie Maurer, the acting director of the Center for Community Engagement at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and one of the principal members of Vibrant Hawaii, a community building movement on Hawaii Island. So Julie, in this final section, I want to accomplish what I think are three things. So first, I want to spend a few minutes having you explain something called the Bonner Program, which is at UH Hilo yeah. Center for Community Engagement. Um, it's a student leadership cohort funded by COVID funds. You were awarded through the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Grant, or GEAR. So okay. what will be the focus of this leadership training as you get started? What is its North Star? And who are the young people mm. this program will be training? Well, there are a couple things that I really was drawn to. The Bonner program is a national program. And so we made a request to start one at UH Hilo. It's the first one in Hawaii. And the things that I find really important about it have to do with equity and inclusion mm -hmm. and community. So the students are paid, which is the first thing that's slightly unusual about it, because a lot of the work that they do would normally be considered volunteer work. So it is grounded in community engagement, but it gives the students four years and they start in the program really kind of talking about place, talking about identity, understanding, kind of building an understanding of where they are and how they can plug in. Yeah. So then once they start engaging with community, we've had these conversations about privilege. We've had conversations about, you know, what does it mean to be, quote unquote, a helper? Mm. What does that mean if you think of yourself in that way about the organization or the people or whatever you are helping? And those dynamics of power and hierarchies in our in our society these are really important conversations to have before you just start sending students out and having there be potential for more harm than good to happen mm -hmm. so that was a really important quality the equity part in being paid means that for me students who need to work can still engage in the program. Mm, that's great. Yeah, I mean, most of our students work. We don't 
really have a student population anymore, um, at least not a big one, who just go to school full time. Mm -hmm. These students are doing multiple things, caring for family, working, you know, going to school. And so giving them this opportunity that can, you know, stand in that role of working, but is also giving them workshops in leadership and important conversations, design thinking, project management, you know, exploration of self and what their passions are. So they start by engaging with community in kind of more Mm one-offs so they can go and volunteer for a few hours, for half a day, something like that. And they experience a lot of different types of organizations and ways of volunteering because there's all different types of volunteering that you can do and ways to make impact. But then as they move through, they really start committing to an organization that really resonates for them. Mm -hmm. And this longer term commitment allows them to, you know, see more of the complexities that go on in real issues, not just the, the surface level stuff, but how complicated are issues like climate change and how, you know, to, you know, woven our social, environmental, behavioral, all of these things that come into play. So it really helps the students to see what they're working with at a much deeper and real level. Mm. But it also, the last thing that I found really important is that sometimes when students, you know, are engaging with a community organization, It can actually be a little bit challenging for some of our community organizations because the investment that they're putting in on their end to train or help guide isn't long enough for them to really have a return Mm -hmm. of, you know, the student ability growing far enough for them to really give back and contribute in meaningful ways like capacity building ways. So the four years gives us that opportunity to help students, give them space to reflect and think about what they're doing and get out into the community in longer term, Mm -hmm. longer term commitments, right? So the organization can really see and and get some great support from the training and mentorship that they give. Wow. The 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 four year part of that to me is just the essence of innovation. Um, that <laughs> that right that you would come to that place where you would say, look, a one off would be one year and you might have some good experiences and maybe the community organization that you partner with might have a good experience. But if you do it over four years, then you start to get into the relationship building part. Um, exactly. and, and that's extremely deep. So, so Julie, yeah. what I want to do in this moment is to honor the Bonner program by actually saying the names of the members of this first UH Hilo Bonner leadership cohort. Um, so I'm going to read their mm-hmm. names here into the record. So their Thank names you. are Amena Tep, Bella Chapman, Carly Atkins, Devin Brown, Yvonne Fronda, and Lavinia Manufekai. And I wish them all the best <laughs> in the world as they move forward. And I know that you're looking for um, a coordinator to hire who can help move um, mm-hmm. the whole process forward. So that's great. So Julie, we yeah. have we have two more things to do here as we come down to the end. Okay. So you listed as influential in your life, UCLA researcher Mike Rose's book, Lives on the Boundary, a moving account of the struggles and achievements of America's educationally underprepared. So my question is why? And in, in, in what ways did Mike Rose in this book shape your journey as an educator? Oh, I love that book. Um, I read that when I was a graduate student at San Francisco State and was doing a graduate certificate in the teaching of reading and a graduate certificate in the teaching of writing while I was doing my master's degree. And those certificates were really in preparation for teaching 
what has been called remedial, developmental, reading and writing. And what Mike Rose writes about in such a beautiful way is, well, I, I'm gonna, I, I was going to say one thing and now I have two things that I have to share. Okay. Um, the, <laughs> the first one is that these students are not lacking in anything. They're intelligent and capable. And what I still kind of come back to again and again and again is that every single person who comes in the door or a student who shows up Each one has something in their life experience, their background, their knowledge that I can learn from. And Mm -hmm. that is amazing and an amazing contribution to everybody, whether it's a classroom or, you know. And so that sense that, you know, there's there was at that time, and I would say there probably still is this sense of less than, you know, when we're talking about students that are described as not prepared for college. Mm. And the way that Mike Rose describes them is not less than Mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. They may be, you know, missing what we think of as, you know, what what academia um, requires, what they're looking for, the way of presenting ideas, the way of talking about things. But that is not a deficit. And so that that aspect of what he talks about really resonated for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And the second part that I love that he talks about so beautifully is, is in some senses the randomness of how we track or place students into things. Yeah. You know? Amen. You know, his own story is, is such a great, you know, description of that, right? Where his name got mixed up with somebody else. So he mm-hmm. ended up in vocational and then they realized, so they moved him. And you think, oh my gosh, like that could be any of us, right? Like, so so what is that? mean for those students, the expectation is so important. I think it shapes so much of what students are going to live up to Mm. is what the person is expecting of them. And so if you're in college prep and the expectation is that you do this, then students will do that. And if you're in, you know, vocational track and the expectation is this, then students will do that. And Mm. I'm always just struck by how those decisions are made and how accurate they really are. Yeah, right. Or inaccurate. (laughs) Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that's great, Julie. And and what I'll do for our listeners is in the show notes, I'm going to provide a link to an incredible On Being podcast episode with Mike Rose back in 2011. It's called The Deepest Meanings of Intellect and Vocation. The interviewer, Krista Tippett, did a great job of helping Mike Rose kind of bring these ideas to the surface. And we'll provide a link to that. It's, you know, oftentimes we say every single person should see this documentary that I just saw, or every single person should read this book. (laughs) And my thought in this moment is every single educator should listen to this podcast episode with Mike Rose and on being. So that's great. And so finally, Julie, I want to end today's awesome conversation by giving you a chance to talk about a very special mentor, someone who said about you, and I quote, I know there somewhere is a girl who can dance on the tables. So who is Doug Brown and what is his place in the pantheon of people who have great meaning in your life? Yeah, I honestly think that I probably would have dropped out of teaching very quickly if I had not um, had the mentorship of of Dr. Doug Brown. He was a professor 
at San Francisco State, and he led a program there for international students. And it was, it served also as a teacher training program for those of us in the MATSL program. And he, I'll never forget, he kind of pulled me out of class one day and he said, you did not apply to teach in the teacher training program. And I was like, no, you know, I, I, you know, I already work full time. I don't know if I can, you know, juggle all of this. And he just looked at me, he said, you need to apply. <laughs> and so I did. Right. Mm-hmm. And when he observed me teaching is when, you know, he said that. And what he was saying is that what he saw in me was the cognitive ability to understand the field, right? Like I could create a lesson plan. I could see it in my head, how you scaffold one thing on top of another and layer this, and then the Mm -hmm. students would do this. And I understood the field and the theory and the ideas really well. But that's not what teaching is, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Teaching is about being in the moment with the students, connecting, adjusting as needed, and being authentic. Mm. And so what Dr. Brown really ended up teaching me at the end of that, I think it was a year and a half that I was in that program, is how to move teaching from the head to the heart. Mm. And I think I, you know, I I saw him a few times, you know, in in the years after I had graduated and started teaching. And I remember having this conversation and just thanking him because I, I really think that I would have not gotten it as quickly as I did if it weren't for him being very honest and kind of blunt. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that I was boring. I was, you know, kind of thinking, but not feeling. Mm. And you can't be a great teacher without the heart and the soul and just being in it with them and knowing who your students are, having fun, being yourself. And that is scary. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I had students who would, you know, like I, I remember having this one group of students and they would always play a game of guessing what shoes I was going to wear that day because <laughs> I I had a, you know, I love shoes. And so you realize, you know, students are paying attention to what you are wearing and what you do and what you say. You know, it's very intimidating that to have 20 people staring at you for, you know, an hour. But that element, I, it really was the most important part of of learning to teach is to really get out of my head and and be there with Mm. them in Mm. this experience because it's an experience. It's a journey you're going on together. You're all in it, you know? Mm. And if you can do that, if you can really be in it with them every step of the way, that's when the good stuff happens. Yeah. And, and students know when you're there and when you're just like following a script, they are incredibly smart. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and that's that's a great shout out to to Dr. Doug Brown. Thank you, Julie, for that. I, you know, it's so funny. Uh, all of my former students, most especially from La Pietra, because I was there for eight years. When I see them, there's this. I, I this is radio, so I can't quite do it. But there's a sort of way that I wave my hands in the air mm-hmm. that looks like I'm paddling like a dog, and it's <laughs> it's actually a it's a it's a very clubbish signal between me and my students, you know, mm. that, that that they were part of the Rapoon experience at La Pietra. <laughs> um, and that's very meaningful to me that, that you know, when they yeah. when I see them and I wave my hands like that, they're like, oh yeah. Um, and so 
So that's a that's a great story about um, Dr. Yeah. Brown. So Julie, um, here at the end, I just want to note that I read an incredible blog that you wrote about Sir Ken Robinson. And uh, we we don't have another hour to talk about Sir Ken. Boy, we sure could. Um, but yeah. I, I just want to acknowledge that I will also put that link into the show notes because it was okay. beautifully written and it was a wonderful tribute to Sir Ken who tragically passed away last year. Um, we lost a great one. Um, and so I will, yeah. I will include the link in the show notes. So... Um, oh, great. So, Dr. Julie Maurer, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. I hope you and your son, Josh, and your extended family remain safe and healthy as we transition to the new year, 2022. Thank you so much, Josh. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. My editor, creative consultant, and sound engineer is the talented Evan Kurohara. Our theme music comes from the vast catalog of music created by my friend of 40 years, the remarkable pianist Michael Sloan. Producer of 12 albums with over 100 songs, Michael Sloan is featured in Apple Music, Spotify, and all the other major music platforms. You can also find his work at his YouTube channel. Michael has listeners in over 100 countries and over 2,000 cities to date. Support these episodes with remarkable, innovative, and imaginative educators and education leaders by giving us your own rating and writing us a review at your favorite podcast store. This series is funded by education change agent Ted Dentersmith, executive producer of the acclaimed documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. Please join the What School Could Be virtual community by going to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or by downloading the What School Could Be app from your favorite app store. The What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Send your feedback to mltsinhawaii at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at mltsinhawaii and at Josh Rapoon. Finally, please like our Most Likely to Succeed in Hawaii Facebook page and YouTube channel. Friends, even as COVID infection numbers decline, Stay safe and please get vaccinated. Most of all, bring kindness and compassion into the world. We need a surplus of both right now. Until the next episode, ahui ho and take care. <laughs>